Sekiro has no character customization, it has no stat leveling, no multiplayer, and apparently no weapons or armor to collect. <sighs> That's heavy. But I'm sure the gameplay we've lost will give way to something more useful. I think that's what Sekiro is about, in more ways than one. And... You'll learn to appreciate its worth. I'll give you an example. Think about leveling up in a Souls game, investing souls in the stats of your character. It's this hugely important system for an RPG, but it is also something that can inhibit freedom and take Dark Souls 1. You have this fantastically interwoven, tangled world design that allows you to progress in random directions to an extent, but many stages and bosses are impossible or tedious for a low-level character. And if you have this open world, why should you be restricted in where you're allowed to go? That's something that Breath of the Wild, for example, did amazingly. And here's the big news. Sekiro is confirmed to be more open world, with the interwoven, tangled level design of the original Dark Souls. <sighs> and that's huge. In addition to this, by sort of stripping away the leveling grind as well, it's going to be a lot easier for them to truly open up the world, because the only barrier to progression in a game like this are your strengths and weaknesses as a player. Their philosophy is going to be, let players explore the world. And my point is, this could be better than what we've lost. So I hope this one example can sort of help convince you that losing one mechanic can manifest itself as a good thing in many other areas. And really, I'm just glad we get to celebrate this return to an interwoven, tangled map design. I feel like Dark Souls set an industry standard with its map design and then kind of abandoned it in subsequent titles. So I really hope we see a return to form here and Honestly, imagine how much more we could do now that we have a jump button. See how high the player is jumping here? That's it. That's the jump. In the E3 demo, apparently almost everything could be hurdled, and it seems like we're going to even be able to go through some walls, hidden passages that are usable only by the shinobi. And all of this, all of this crazy verticality and exploration techniques is permissible because, for the first time, our character is taking on a set class. We are a shinobi, not a spellcasting mage, not a plate-clad tank, we are a katana-wielding shinobi. Always. So, as a result, Sekiro will revolve around our character like never before, because we're actually playing a set protagonist here, and I get it, the first instinct is kind of to freak out. For example, you might worry that the story is going to be linear and shallow, but don't worry, because on the contrary, Miyazaki has stressed that nothing has changed in their stance to storytelling from the previous games, so the game will still have a deep, complex world. It's not like I was freaking out or anything. But unfortunately, having a set protagonist does have some implications for character customization, for example. Uh, no longer will we be able to make these hideous abominations in the character creator, nor will we be able to find weapons or armor to upgrade our character with, and it's gonna be a bit harder to roleplay. But you know what, they haven't completely ruled out customization. So I wonder if you guys have any ideas. Do you think they'll go down the skins route? Neo is our closest parallel. It's this Souls-like game with a male protagonist that can have his entire appearance changed, from smaller tweaks to like his hairstyle and his beard, to entire skins that can have you playing as a female or a different legendary character. And I think having something like this in Sekiro is going to be important, especially if they're unlocked in really interesting ways, like completing a unique or difficult achievement or something like that, because I'd certainly rather complete interesting gameplay challenges than unlock them by spending money in a skins shop, for example. But can't rule that out. At the very least, it does seem like we'll be able to customize our character a bit through the way we play. For instance, which shinobi prosthetic we'll decide to take into battle will definitely play a big part, and we're told that there's supposed to be a sort of upgrade system for them that requires currency, and having a wider range of these will allow us to have more unique ways of approaching combat. And speaking of prosthetics, there's also been a shuriken arm that has been confirmed, 
And I wouldn't be surprised if there were more ranged assassination options like throwing shurikens, uh, considering all the height advantages we're going to have on our enemies, and taking someone out from afar in a stealthy manner sounds like it's right up our alley. So getting into combat, this brings us to swordplay. In the last video, based on how much we saw in the trailer, we speculated that swordplay was going to be way more important, and we were right. Miyazaki described the combat as a clashing of swords, and you're not going to be dashing around your enemies like you do in a Souls game. And this is because of the new posture system, which is at the core of swordplay. It's a meter, which replaces stamina apparently, and revolves around how well you can time the blocking of an attack. So when you block an enemy attack and press block too early, you'll lose a little bit of posture. But if you perfectly time your block, almost as if it was a parry, then your opponent will lose their posture instead. And if you can deplete their posture enough, you'll knock them off balance, opening them up to a critical strike, which finishes your opponent off in a spectacular show of gore and blood. So it's a fascinating system, because having no stamina really incentivizes you to attack, right? But Remember, your opponent can lower your posture as well with a well-timed block, so you will get punished for lazy, predictable attacks. It reminds me a lot of um, For Honor and its combat system, where you have to analyze your opponent's swordplay style, exploiting their weaknesses while also protecting your own. And of course, you have to keep your health in mind as well. Healing items will only carry you so far, so the question is going to become, how willing are you to risk your own health for that perfectly timed block that could knock your opponent off balance and end the fight right there? All I can say is, I've never been this hyped to test out a demo build and try this for myself, because it just sounds so unique. And I know a lot of you are worried about stale movesets, but it's not all bad. Miyazaki states that they intend to implement a number of sword styles that you can learn in the form of skills, allowing you to switch up the way that you use the katana. Also, there's a second katana on the dude's back in the cover art, and I seriously doubt we're not going to be dual wielding that at some point. And that's not all. We speculated about abilities in the last video, and they've been confirmed as well. So according to Variety.com, there are also powerful abilities that can imbue your sword with fire. One particularly useful skill lets you assassinate enemies and then turn their blood into a choking smoke. So I think this is saying we can repurpose the blood of those we kill and turn them into environmental effects. That is cool. Another such skill was the ability to come back to life after death. So continuing with that smoke theme, this ability is apparently called Blood Smoke, allowing you to spring back to life with the press of a button. However, this mechanic is still in the process of being fine-tuned, but according to Miyazaki, revives are currently guaranteed once, uh, with additional revives requiring additional resources. And from the interviews, you get this sense that they're very aware that we might think this makes the game easy, but rest assured, they actually intend to make this game even more difficult than the previous entries, uh, with no difficulty slider. So, shadows die twice, but casuals will die more than twice. And the amazing thing about the revive mechanic is how fluidly it matches the stealth aspect of the game, because it's such a natural way of establishing a state of de-aggro where enemies have forgotten about you, leaving you in a position where you can either walk away and take your losses, or double down and reinitiate the fight if you're thirsting for revenge. Miyazaki mentions that when you meet an enemy in this game, you won't be immediately plunged into battle. The levels are designed to let you observe enemies, split them up, or take them out quietly one by one. And apparently, get this, you can even listen in on enemies if you're close enough. I mean, their mouths won't move, it's from software, but apparently their conversations will give you hints about their strengths and weaknesses, but forget gameplay for a second, are you guys thinking what I'm thinking? Can you imagine all the fantastic lore that we might be able to overhear? That would be such a cool method of discovering it, right? Oh, this is fantastic, it suits souls so well. And stealth makes it into boss fights as well. At E3, cat and mouse boss fights were described against incomprehensibly large monsters, where one has to use stealth in the fight itself to gain an advantage. And you all remember the Dragon God from Demon's Souls, don't you? 
It's like the only example of stealth gameplay in Souls, I think, and it's not a great fight, but imagine how damn exciting this could be with actual stealth mechanics. Honestly, I've never been more excited for boss fights, because in addition to stealth boss fights, imagine how well the grappling hook and jump button could work in them. Because in Souls, large monsters are often a really big chore to fight against, right? They take up too much screen real estate, and we often only ever see their feet. It's not good. But in Sekiro, you have the opportunity to get some distance from a boss and fit them in your camera because an entire new dimension has opened up above us. Imagine a Shadow of the Colossus style boss that has to be ascended to be defeated. Or what about fighting another shinobi that has you jumping and free running all over the place? They could even implement chase sequences where you have to free run across rooftops. There's just, my mind is going wild with all the opportunities they have here and I hope they live up to it. The only two bosses that we've seen so far though are the giant snake, which apparently has to be stealthed past in the canyon, and this, the corrupted monk, an 11 foot tall woman wielding a naginata blade, which was something that was commonly wielded by women of the samurai class, as it allowed them to keep men at a distance where advantages in height, weight, and upper body strength would matter a lot less. The corrupted monk allegedly fights with illusion, cloning herself and coming at you in this arena that is billowing with cherry blossom petals. Oof. But you know what kind of ruins boss fights sometimes? Having three people wail on them in co-op. It is true that the experience is often a little bit lesser for those who make every single boss a breeze by summoning others. I mean, if Edward can get through Dark Souls, then maybe there's something wrong here. So, coming as a surprise to many, Sekiro will feature no multiplayer. According to Yoshihiro of From Software, they wanted to focus on the single player experience without any of the limitations that come with designing a game meant as multiplayer. So, personally, for me, this is pretty devastating. I don't feature it much on the channel, but I love PvP and multiplayer in my games. But for the sake of argument, I will admit that there are advantages to designing without it. Uh, for example, can you imagine how difficult it would be to place fog gates in a world that is really open like Sekiro, especially open on the vertical level? And also, enemies won't have to be designed to target multiple players. And hopefully, the resources that they're saving from balancing everything in a PvP sense can be fully invested elsewhere. However, I remain to be convinced that connections to other worlds won't exist at all in some capacity. I mean, not having a bloodstain or a messaging mechanic would be pretty rough, and Activision is pretty synonymous with multiplayer titles. It's good, however, to see that both companies seem to have really healthy boundaries. Miyazaki's stressing that all the decisions after the title screen still belong to them and that Activision actually has a lot of data and internal testing that has been invaluable to them as a smaller studio, especially when it comes to new players not quitting in the first 10 minutes. There are some really good interviews with Robert Conkey of Activision and Yasuhiro Kiteo of From Software in the description. So even though Sekiro has less Souls elements than expected, this is good for From. Because people who actually care about From Software as a studio know that they need to experiment with new things. And while we all love souls, even I don't want them to do it forever, and I rely on it. They'll go creatively bankrupt if they do. And there are a lot of studios that do that, and it's never a good thing in the end. So please, if you see anyone online or in the comments expressing absolute despair about this game, challenge them on their way of thinking. I have a lot of faith that you guys will be able to do that. Tell them to stay calm and you know, subscribe to Vidi Video on Patreon. Throw that in there somewhere. And if all else fails, remind them that there will always be other games on the horizon. Many prominent leakers are actually stating that Sekiro wasn't even the Souls-like game that they were anticipating being announced, and that there is another, more Souls-like game coming soon. It's just rumours, but... We'll likely see more gameplay of Sekiro at Gamescom, showing the demo that journalists got to play behind closed doors at E3. Until then, we still have to talk about the story of this game, the tale of a lonely shinobi who lost his young master. So for that, I'll see you next time.